thanks for joining us today. Good to see you all. Uh, first, I'd like to note that uh, today's the one year anniversary of the first case of COVID in the United States, first documented case. And as you know, it was right here in Snohomish County. It's hard to believe it's been a year. It's hard to believe it's only been a year too, but lots happened in that year. And uh, we just are continuing to stay focused on keeping our healthcare system functioning, uh, helping those who are most impacted by the pandemic and speeding uh, our vaccine delivery. So we'll stay focused on those goals until we're through this. Uh, second, I'd like to let everybody know that we are opening our third round of small business grants today. Uh, they just went live on the website. Uh, if a small business in Snohomish County that has been impacted by COVID-19 has not received a CARES Act grant, they should go to the WorkforceSnohomish.org website to see if they are eligible. Uh, any business that's already applied for our R3 grant and has not received one will automatically be eligible for the new round of the grant and they do not need to apply. So if you've applied before, did not receive an R3 grant, you're automatically put in, in the line. So I really appreciate our partnership with Workforce Snohomish and the incredible work they've done really to help us administer these grants. Uh, third thing I wanna talk a bit about is our vaccine plans here in Snohomish County. Uh, Currently, we have the capacity in our drive-through sites to administer approximately 30,000 doses of vaccine per week. If we had the vaccine supply, we could quickly ramp up uh, to being able to deliver 50,000 doses or more a week just in our sites alone. And these are the drive-up sites, uh, one in Everett currently, one down at Edmonds College, and one out in Monroe at the fairgrounds. The bottom line is we need more vaccines for our drive-through sites. Uh, I am frustrated and find it frustrating that we're having to fight for uh, extra doses each week. Last week, uh, we were given an allocation of only 2,300 doses uh, by the state. Uh, we complained about it. We were able to receive an extra thousand doses uh, from another county and another facility that helped a little bit, but uh, 3,000, 3,300 is far below the 30,000 capacity that we have stood up. I know that the state is not getting adequate supplies either, and they have to provide for 39 counties. So I understand the complexity of this, but I want to assure everybody we have the capacity in Snohomish County and can do more. Um, when you're looking at the statistics uh, statewide, <clears throat> first of all, uh, we know that the state uh, data about Snohomish County's vaccine isn't accurate. So just be assured we are getting the vaccine out uh, quickly and we're not sitting on stockpiles. One note of caution, just because a private healthcare entity uh, has a lot of doses doesn't mean that we can get our hands on it, uh, nor should the county be penalized for what a private entity is doing. So if somebody else is not getting their vaccine out in a timely manner, we certainly do not wanna be punished for that. We understand that some challenge uh, for some medical providers to provide large numbers of doses quickly. Uh, that's exactly why we set up our drive-through mass vaccination sites to move larger numbers of doses to sites that can handle them. So we're pleased with most of what was announced yesterday by the governor. Uh, it seems uh, to show a necessary urgency for getting vaccines into the hands of those who can deliver them into our residents. We want our economy back open as quickly as possible and get our kids back to school and getting that vaccine out to as many people as quickly as possible is the best way to do that. I have to say, I am extremely proud of the work our emergency management director, Jason Bierman and his team working at the Emergency Coordination Center have done over the past year. Uh, Jason had the vision to start planning for mass vaccinations back in July and he's been leading efforts to make sure we can vaccinate <clears throat> everyone in our county. There are thousands of people across the county who are working very hard to get us to the other side of the COVID pandemic. So we know that's what the public needs and wants. We'll continue to do everything we can to speed the vaccination effort. I ask for everybody's patience as we get this system up and running and uh, work out some of the kinks. So. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Spitters from the Snohomish Health District. 
Well, thank you, Executive Summers, and good morning, everyone. And uh, that's right, one year ago today, a Snohomish County man went to a walk-in clinic displaying symptoms of this new viral respiratory disease after having returned from uh, Wuhan, China. And at that moment, with guidance from the Health District and the State Department of Health, the evaluating clinician collected appropriate specimens that were sent by courier to the airport. And by 10 p.m. that evening, those specimens were on an airplane to CDC's lab in Atlanta. The patient was isolated at home and the health district reached out to drop off supplies uh, and give him instructions on, on staying home and what to do if he became more severely ill. Uh, less than 24 hours later, we were notified that his lab results were indeed positive for the what was then called novel coronavirus 2019, now known as uh, COVID-19. It was very hard for us to believe in the moment. We were shocked and also had a lot of anxiety based upon reports of what we were hearing from overseas, both in terms of the, 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 the uh, breadth of spread and the severity of illness. And that was on a Monday afternoon at about 3.30 p.m. Uh, we spent the rest of that day and evening uh, well into the nighttime hours uh, here at the health district in calls with the Department of Health, CDC, and Providence Medical Center to sort out the case's condition is transferred to the hospital at CDC's request for observation and to launch control efforts targeted at close contacts. Uh, the next day, on Tuesday, January 21, after getting those results, the Health District, Department of Health, and CDC formally announced the first case of COVID-19 uh, detected in the U.S. in Snohomish County. This agency, and I would say this community, will be forever changed from that moment forward. The pandemic has turned out to be everything and more that we feared in terms of scope and impact on society. In many cases, it's honestly exceeded what we thought was possible in those early days. However, we know now more to help uh, how to deal with the pandemic. We have more knowledge about what can and can't be done about the virus. And we've seen scientists and experts across the globe guide our efforts. It's remarkable to think that testing technology was developed in a matter of weeks and has been continuously improved on since then. Countless other tools and increased knowledge to control the virus have emerged from the ongoing cycle of inquiry, data collection, analysis, policy development, and further inquiry. The scientific method has also now brought hope for an exit from the pandemic in the form of a safe and effective uh, vaccine, and in fact, multiple safe and effective vaccines. So here we are, a year into this response, the longest in the health district agency's history. All of the vaccine planning, testing, case investigation, contact tracing, data collection, communications, hiring and purchasing takes an enormous amount of resources. We started this pandemic with 113 full-time equivalents. Since then, it has been all hands on deck with extraordinarily long days, weeks and months of full commitment to the response. Uh, but that, that response certainly has not been limited to the health district. Uh, uh, this has only been possible thanks to the leadership and support of the Board of Health and the strong partnership with Snohomish County, especially Executive Summers and Director Bierman in the Department of Emergency Management, as well as technical and financial assistance from the state and federal government. With emergency funding from a variety of resources, we've been able to more than double our size in order to meet the, the, man, the demands of the response. I am forever grateful to this dedicated, hardworking and flexible team here at the Health District. They are true public servants and I could not do my part of the job without them doing theirs. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the collective will and support of our local governments, healthcare systems, emergency medical system, and Snohomish County residents and businesses. Thousands in this county have sacrificed time with friends and families, lost jobs or businesses, or have lost loved ones to COVID. I recognize that the decisions made have both short and lasting impacts as we move through this, and we have a long road of recovery ahead of us. With this pandemic, the societal impacts have been so vast and encompassing, Many decisions uh, that have been made uh, are shared with a broader set of partners, both within and outside government, to take into account those impacts and try to mitigate them as best we can while still controlling the virus. This has been a whole community response and we're fortunate to have great leaders in Snohomish County and across the state sharing the load. 
Well, this certainly has been the largest and most complex response in our collective careers as public servants. The principles underlying the health district's response are very much the same as for other communicable diseases. One challenge with public health is that it can be hard to specifically quantify the benefit of our efforts. We intervene broadly and we don't have a control group left without an intervention to compare against. We can't count what didn't occur as a result of our work and as a result of the community's sacrifices. But what I do know is that this collective response has saved lives, has spared hospital capacity, and has prevented suffering. More of the same, and hopefully a return to normalcy, will be achieved with rollout of the vaccines. Vaccines are coming, but they're not all here yet. Uh, Executive Summers uh, covered that quite thoroughly. And that's why it's very important for us to prioritize the highest risk populations. Vaccination of 1A healthcare providers and facility staff, as well as 1A long-term care uh, uh, residents and staff. Uh, a partnership between the federal government and CVS and Walgreens uh, to address the long-term care facilities is underway and is picking up steam. Our team is working to get updates on how many vaccines have indeed been administered through Saturday and we'll have that posted online later today. Uh, I can tell you that uh, approximately 60% of the 35,000, those are round figures, uh, doses distributed to Snohomish County have been uh, administered. And um, there, as Executive Summers mentioned, there's a gap between that figure and what you would see on the state uh, the state's website. Uh, that is what it is, but uh, the, the, that's the current state. As the Department of Health and the governor announced yesterday, we are now beginning to open vaccines for those in phase 1B1. Uh, as part of that, uh, that uh, originally was going to be individuals 70 years and older. The state changed that to 65 years and older. That's approximately 120,000 individuals, as well as those who are 50 or older and living in a household with multiple generations, uh, specifically people who are over 50 are unable to live independently and who have a caregiver who either lives or works outside the home. That's uh, what's meant by that uh, group over 50 living in a multi-generational household. Now the number of people over 50, uh, 50 to 64 years of age is that uh, are in that group, it's, it's hard to define, but it's probably somewhere in between, uh, you know, 20 to 40,000 people. So we, we have probably about 150,000 residents now eligible for the vaccine through phase 1B. And this is great news, but as even one of the questions I have seen on the chat already indicated, we don't have the, uh, the vaccines to give out today. So uh, it's not like people who are 1B1 eligible will jump into the internet and find an appointment for tomorrow. Uh, so we need folks to continue to be patient as the vaccine supply ramps up to get those appointments and we uh, further build out the capacity to, to through our, our uh, these high throughput um, vaccine clinics to, to get people through. And in the meantime, we need folks to be patient and wait their turn in line. Where people currently land in the prioritization, whether you're 1A, 1B1, or beyond, uh, is not a reflection on their va value to society uh, as deemed by government or public health. If we had an unlimited vaccine supply and clinical capacity to administer those doses, prioritization would not be necessary and it would all just flow naturally. But we have neither unlimited vaccine supply nor unlimited immunization capacity although uh, tremendous gains are being achieved by the Department of Emergency Management in standing that up, as uh, Executive Summers mentioned. So until vaccines start flowing into Washington and into Snohomish County at a higher and more predictable pace, we have to prioritize people to preserve healthcare capacity and those who are at higher risk of complications or death if they were to get COVID. As things roll out further, maintenance of essential functions of society and its critical infrastructure will also come to, into the prioritization scheme. Please note that these phases and tiers reflect the work of multidisciplinary teams working at both the federal and the state level, both in government and in academia, to maximize societal benefits, to support essential functions of society, 
and to address inequities in access to services. This work has involved medical scientists, social scientists, ethicists, and outreach to community stakeholders. Again, at the current moment, prioritization of limited supply is not aimed at those at higher risk of acquiring COVID, but at those most likely to become severely ill, require hospitalization, and or die. The goal is to get you all vaccinated and keep you safe as soon as feasible. And we're all working toward that goal every day. But the first order of business is to diffuse the threat of an overwhelming hospital surge. While you are waiting for your turn, here are four things you can do to help. First, go to findyourphasewa, findyourphasewa.org to see if you're eligible for phase 1A or 1B1. If you aren't, you can sign up to be notified with a text or an email when your phase does open up. Two, please don't try to play the system or jump the line. If you jump forward out of place and succeed, you're pushing someone else backward. If you hear of a place with vaccines, let other people who are eligible know. When it's time for you to get your vaccine, register and keep your appointment. And continue to do these three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance from others. Vaccine distribution at this scale and speed is a first in our lifetimes and, a public, and public health and our partners are learning in real time. On that note, along with Executive Summers, I want to afford special thanks to Jason Beerman with the D Director of the Department of Emergency Management, as well as Snohomish County Emergency Management uh, Services for already having established the county's first three high, high throughput sites. We all will need to keep working together, being flexible and patient, making adjustments as we go, just as we have been doing for the last year with other elements of the COVID response. With that, I'll turn it back over to Executive Summers. Thank you, Doctor. Um, before we get into the questions, uh, one issue that uh, I'd like you to talk to just very briefly. So you mentioned that uh, over 60% of our vaccines have been administered. Uh, it's my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, that that other 40% approximately, much of that uh, may be being withheld so that, to assure that we have the second dose for people. Is that part of that 40% or is that not? Yeah, I assume that is uh, a part of it. You, you may recall there was some news a week or two ago where Initially, the, the, the paradigm was to hold vaccine back at the federal level to uh, as a, a, a store for that second dose. Uh, but you, you remember the, the, the federal government said, no, we're, we're not operating that way. And so uh, I think many uh, vaccine providers, though, are doing that, trying to, trying to hold that back. Uh, and, and then the other um, uh, possible contributor is that in their setting, they're reaching diminishing returns on the 1A group. And so uh, all the more reason for us to push ahead with 1B1. So this is one of the complexities we're working through with the state is uh, one of the new guidelines is to have us uh, administer the vaccines within seven days, but we have to also plan for the second dose. Uh, scheduling for appointments can take more than a week, frankly. And so there's just some uh, questions on how the system is going to work, but um, we're working with the state on that. Uh, there was a question about the website as has already been mentioned that will be updated. Uh, people may have to refresh their websites. If you have a cached version of a website, you can actually be looking at something that's stored on your computer and not off the internet. So please refresh um, and we'll get that corrected right away. Um, the last, oh, last week we said uh, we'd run out of vaccines by the middle of the week. Uh, where do we stand this week with uh, vaccine supply? Doctor? Uh, yeah, I think we'll, based on what, what I told you, there would be roughly 40% uh, that's still, you know, in stock and not in arms. I think the opening up of 1B, it's not like it's all going to just happen today and, and all flow out tomorrow and the next day. But I imagine over the next week or two, uh, the implementation of the 1B1 will start to use up that vaccine. People who are 1A eligible and still haven't had it done, they certainly uh, are at the head of the line too. Uh, but I, I believe that opening this up will help uh, you know, get more vaccine into arms. Uh, and more importantly, as, as Executive Summers has mentioned, we, 
despite that that proportion of supply, you know, we're we're holding back in in a sense on our capacity to put people through, and we need we need vaccine to to schedule those appointments. We're not we can't schedule appointments without knowing that we have vaccine coming. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, it's a challenge. Okay, uh, so reflecting on today's anniversary. Um... Dr. Cruz, if you want to go first, do you want to reflect on your personal reactions last year to learning Snohomish County had the country's first known COVID case? Well, you know, uh, uh, it was shocking uh, and, uh, and a little overwhelming. It's a brand new disease that you we had heard about across the ocean causing widespread illness, hospitalizations, uh, way over what the system had capacity for. And uh, so it was uh, extremely intimidating and anxiety provoking. And, um, you know, overall, it turned out that uh, most of that, uh, much of that anxiety and concern was well-founded. Uh, but uh, I think our, it was somewhere between our best hopes and our worst fears. And, and here we are a year later. I have to say, this is just a miraculous thing in the history of, of public health and medical science that we're talking about. Uh, the difficulties of rolling out a vaccine just one year uh, to the day later, I don't think there's another condition that's arisen in human history where that timeline has been that short. And I am just eternally grateful to the medical scientists that made that happen. Yeah, and looking back, I remember uh, the phone call I got, I was driving and Jason Beerman, uh, my emergency management director called me and said they, we had had a documented case and it was it was kind of like a punch to the gut. Uh, we had been watching what was going on in China and knew that this uh, virus was very serious. I think at first you kind of hope that uh, it's contained and that one person maybe hasn't spread it, but in short order, um, you know, we found out that that was not the case. And I just remember sort of all of a sudden the the whole year in front of us became foggy and uh, unclear on the magnitude of the uh, disease and what it was going to mean. But in very short order, we were starting to think about needing field hospitals and uh, quarantine sites and, you know, everything just sort of started uh, being a day-to-day -day event. We were having daily calls both internally and externally to get out information. So it really turned the whole year and everybody's lives upside down. And so that's went from cautious hope to, uh, oh my gosh, we gotta really focus on this uh, very, in sh very short order, but really proud of the team and really par proud of the county. And as Dr. Spitter said, having a vaccine a year later and wor worrying about that is just a great thing. So um, next question, how is the health district and county letting people know beyond the state's phase finder when and where they can get vaccinated? So um, may I take a shot at that executive summers and then you can round out as you see fit. Uh, so the phase finder is the primary tool for individuals to assess their eligibility and then to get uh, to have the system prompt them when they do become eligible. So if you have internet connectivity, go to phase finder, find my phase, wa.org and sign up. And that is the primary tool. Healthcare systems uh, are encouraged to, uh, uh, for instance, uh, they can now notify their enrolled uh, members over 65, you know, hey, you're up to bat. Um, Washington State's still working on developing its uh, vaccine finder, and uh, we don't have a universal scheduling system. So if you have access to the internet, you can go to the health district's website, click through the vaccine icons, and you'll find yourself at the Department of Emergency Management's page for the, the high throughput sites. Uh, they are currently all scheduled out, and we're not sure we're when we're going to update that because that's going to depend on when we see we have vaccine coming. Uh, currently, they're all filled up through the week. Um, so there's that, and then uh, you can contact your healthcare provider. Uh, in the interest of communication systems of the healthcare system, if you're not yet eligible, 
please don't contact your healthcare provider either through my chart or via phone. They are overwhelmed right now with this. And so they really want contact limited to those who are eligible. And so that would be your, your other avenue. Certainly for folks without a connection to primary care or, and without uh, internet connectivity, we as a you know, health district and society have to kind of figure out means to reach out to those communities and individuals. Um, but meanwhile, we, we do need to move uh, ahead as fast as we can with, with the tools we've got. Yeah, just to uh, put an emphasis on that, if people don't have internet access, you just need to contact their healthcare providers. Um, you know, we've got a system of both private caregivers and, and public caregivers, and each one is a little bit different. So the doctor said there's no universal scheduling at this point, but we're working to try to get that capability. If you do not have it yet, so contact your healthcare provider. If you do have internet, check the health district's website. Um, let's see, uh, how confident are you that private providers are ready for phase 1B? Um, and then a question for me, uh, hinted a local provider may be sitting on doses. Any more information on that? Uh, do you want to talk about private providers? Well, cer certainly, uh, you know, the, the, well, vaccines, especially vaccines for children and an annual influenza vaccine are part of the routine for primary care settings. Uh, you know, mass vaccination is not. Several healthcare systems have set up mass vaccination uh, opportunities for their 1A eligible workers and, and, uh, and have also helped by vaccinating uh, 1A eligible workers who are not their own. But those have been you know, set aside clinics in the usual flow of, of primary care, you know, most of those appointments were scheduled a long time ago, and many of the people coming through will not be eligible uh, because of their just their age and risk factors. So it, uh, while it's an opportunity, I would say primary care is an opportunity to vaccinate uh, individuals who come through and are eligible. It's not the best means to for us to get to the other end of this uh, it's not going to afford high threat throughput. Um, so we need that, but we also need these high throughput settings that both the county and the healthcare system uh, and other partners potentially are looking at setting up. And, and I imagine that a month from now, we'll have even more of those than we do now, and our capacity will be greatly increased. Hopefully, we'll have the vaccine supply to match that. Uh, and then there will be other needed uh, uh, venues, if you will, for reaching harder to reach populations, whether those are, uh, you know, mobile uh, or stand up, you know, smaller clinics to reach pockets of, of need, uh, all those are going to be needed. So the healthcare system and primary care is a necessary and helpful ingredient, but it cannot be our only vehicle. And there was a question for me, I hinted a local provider may be sitting on doses, uh, any information. It's not that I don't think that anybody's sitting on doses. I think as early in this uh, distribution of vaccine, it was pushed out to private healthcare providers as well as uh, the public. Okay, and if you're in a sort of like a hospital setting, uh, it's that's not a mass vaccination setup. It's not quick uh, and easy. So the flow rate is going to be a little bit different. And we are aware, are aware that the statistics that we see at the state side show some larger organizations like Kaiser and others have uh, a bit of a, uh, have been gotten a good supply and are a little slower in getting them out. But that's, you know, that's just the nature of the system. I'm not criticizing anybody for that, but it's one of the issues we have to work through with the state is matching up the flow of vaccine to our capability to get it out. And the mass vaccination sites are designed to do as many people as possible quickly. And uh, that's why we have stood them up. Um, is there any update on the COVID metrics, case count, deaths, hospitalization trends? Maybe a high overview, doctor. Sure. So uh, we're still probably later today, we'll have the two, rolling two week rate uh, up through last Saturday out. We don't have that out yet. Uh, uh, yesterday was a holiday and some of the staff uh, didn't work. So we'll, we'll today's kind of like a Monday for us. So we'll 
get, try to get that out by the end of the day. Uh, no predictions, but I don't expect, based on the number of case counts that came through, um, you know, this day by day, I think we're looking sort of level at best. I, I think I'd be surprised to see a decline. So in summary, we had a peak in late December. It came down a little bit and then is going back up. I think that decline and the increase is related to the holidays, uh, both decreased testing and decreased taste, case detection around the holidays, and then um, a rebound in case detection and probably some increased cases, uh, you know, increased transmission around the holidays leading to increased case detection in the first week of January up through the 9th. And I, I suspect we'll see that at best level probably increased again uh, um, up, up through last Saturday. Hospitalizations, the hospital census, the total number of people in Snohomish County hospitals, relatively stable in the you know, 110 to 120 range, about 90 of those are confirmed, about 30 are suspected awaiting test results. The number of new hospital admissions per week uh, had been increasing through the end of December uh, up to about 65 uh, new hospitalizations per week related to COVID. That excludes people with COVID hospitalized for non-COVID reasons. And then there was a big drop during the first week of January, leading me to think that that's uh, sort of a, a time-related reporting artifact and that those numbers are still too fresh. Uh, so I would, and deaths have a similar trend uh, where they went up and then dropped off for the last week of reporting. So when we get the new data in the coming week uh, or two, I think you'll see, um, I expect the hospitalizations and deaths to mirror and lag behind the increase, the further increase in cases. So we'll probably see you know, things went up, they went down a little bit, and then they'll go up again. That part's kind of out of our control, the, the hospitalizations and deaths related to disease that's already been transmitted. But again, I urge everyone to, you know, we're so close here. Let's try to, you know, do those three W's and let's bend this curve and get, get things back down again. Uh, uh, vaccine alone is not going to open up society in the short run. We need your help to reduce transmission using the old fashioned methods that we've been promoting for months and months, uh, but they work. And so let's get there. There's a question about whether um, reporters and photographers will be allowed to the vaccine sites. I'm not familiar with the policy on that. Um, so. Well, uh, in general, uh, 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 unsolicited photography in a healthcare setting is is prohibited by law because it it you know that photo ends up in the paper that's a, a violation of a person's uh, protected health information. So uh, uh, permission to do that would have to come through the uh, if you want to pursue that with a healthcare facility, you'd have to uh, try to work with their communications folks and see if they have uh, patients and providers who are willing. Uh, to make that disclosure in public. Okay, and there's a follow-up. Uh, will vaccine provider information now be made public? Do we know, is there a state website or list of everybody who has received vaccine doses? Uh, I'm not aware of one. The, the, right, uh, at least up until yesterday, uh, uh, healthcare settings could elect whether or not to be listed. And some uh, legitimately, many in Snohomish County legitimately elected not to be listed because they were getting overwhelmed with phone calls. And it was, you know, it was swamping them from being able to do their true vaccine related work. So, uh, but I saw an email from the state yesterday saying that all providers will be listed. Um, so I, I haven't been able to verify that yet, but on the Washington State COVID vaccine website, Based on that statement, uh, you could check and see, and there's a list of providers by county. Okay. Um, how soon will mass vaccination sites be up and running? Well, to be clear, we have three up and running now. They have been uh, um, one of them for about three weeks now, and uh, all three of them uh, last week. So, and we are ready to stand up additional sites. Uh, we've been planning for nine or more additional sites that could be up and running in short order, but we do not have the vaccine to uh, support those sites. As I already mentioned, we have the capacity to deliver 30,000 doses a week now up and running available, but we last 
week only got about 3,200, 3,300 doses. So you can see the problem there. It's no use standing up additional sites until we get an increased supply of vaccine. So we'll stay tuned on that one. We're working on it. Uh, that's why the, the announcement last week that the Federal Reserve of vaccine that was going to be released actually didn't exist. So that was a uh, very uh, hard news to take because we were hoping there would be an influx of additional vaccine, but that's not the case. Um, let's see, there's a call center, um, some information. Uh, the governor said yesterday that all vaccine supply that arrived before this week must be administered by Sunday. Are you afraid limited allocations from the state and federal government will make it difficult to guarantee second doses and be able to vaccinate new people? Uh, doctor, you wanna start on that? Uh, yeah, and I'm just, uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'm going to reread the question, uh, afraid limited allocations from the state. If government. we have to push them out by Sunday, the seven day right. limit, does that right. cause concern for being able to guarantee people the second dose? Right. Well, if vaccine doesn't flow downstream, it will, uh, right? If we're, if we have a policy change that it's no longer acceptable, which is the implication of this 95% rule, uh, that you have to get all the vaccine out the door within a week. You can't, at a provider level, you can't hold back vaccine for dose two. So uh, that will make our success in administering or providing the vaccine to administer the second dose highly dependent on a continuous dynamic flow of vaccine uh, from the manufacturers to the state and onto us. And um, so we're at the mercy of that and uh, it raises concern uh, but it is what it is. We got to deal with it and just advocate for uh, a better uh, and more transparent flow of vaccine. And to be clear, the, the prior state policy was that it was not only acceptable, but encouraged to hold back that second dose so it was available. And it's one of the questions we have with the new seven day policy is that no longer the policy? And I think. You know, we've been in constant contact with the State Department of Health and, and the governor's office to try to clarify some of these questions. But yes, it does cause concern. Um, let's see, is the county going to be receiving any of the state's volunteer vaccinators and is the National Guard helping at the drive through sites? Yeah. Um, I'll give my knowledge and then maybe you can round it out, Executive Summers. I, uh, so Seattle uh, Visiting Nurses is a, is a mobile-oriented uh, uh, enterprise that, that historically has done outreach for uh, flu vaccine to long-term care facilities, uh, places of employment, et cetera. And Department of Emergency Management, Snohomish County, have teamed up with, with Seattle Visiting Nurses to run two of the sites. And, um, uh, you know, we're, I think we're well stocked there as well as out at the Monroe site. It's conceivable in the long run, we'll need more volunteers, but I don't think, my understanding is that staffing is not the, the rate limiting ingredient here, it's, it's vaccine. Yeah, that's consistent with what I know, and I'm not aware of any National Guard helping currently. You know, if all of a sudden the supply increased dramatically and we were able to stand up those other sites, we probably would be seeking additional help with vaccinators. But as the doctor said, currently the supply of the vaccine is the limiting factor, not the number of vaccinators that we have. Um, how far are we from seeing vaccinations at pharmacies or places like Costco? And how many providers are approved in Snohomish County currently? Uh, I can move that up. Uh, so right now in Snohomish County, uh, we've got 54 approximately, these, are, these numbers are a few days old, but uh, as of the end of last week, 54 approved vaccine providers, 46 uh, with pending approval, some final step or two on their application, and then another 91 in the hopper who have submitted an application but haven't been vetted yet. Uh, so that's, that's the status of that. The state has committed to trying to uh, resolve all those applications uh, promptly. So we look forward to that. And uh, pharmacies are some of the vaccine provider applicants. And, um, you know, the, they're, they're, 
certainly going to contribute. Uh, it'll depend on their staffing and their space configurations as to whether they can be high throughput or whether they're just additional help. Uh, so, you know, the larger the space, uh, the more amenable it would be to, to high throughput. Uh, but your, your average, you know, neighborhood pharmacy is, is uh, going to have its throughput limited by space because we need to have physical distancing in all settings, including during that 15 to 30 minute waiting period after the vaccine. So if you don't have a place for people to line up and to wait, uh, it's, it's a challenge, whether it's in a healthcare providers, you know, primary care office, a neighborhood pharmacy, what have you. And uh, to be clear, the uh, certification of those sites does go through the state. That's not a local issue. Uh, it's not a local uh, issue. Uh, and and it's, uh, the state is prohibited from delegating that down to us by federal policy. Uh, so it's, it's a tightly regulated. Becoming a, a vaccine provider of publicly funded vaccines carries with it a high level of responsibility in, in the uh, procurement handling, shipping, storage, administration, and that has to be vetted by the state health department. Yeah. And just to reiterate a earlier point, as we've got, uh, we could have well over hundred providers just in the county, but currently, you know, the vaccine supply is limited. So we end up uh, then distributing the state's allocation out to more providers. and. It'll be helpful in terms of getting the vaccine to people in many, many different settings, but the supply issue really is a critical one that we solve that uh, issue. And go back to clarify an earlier point uh, with the new guidance yesterday, some of the questions we have is uh, for the seven day getting the vaccines in people within seven days, is that for the county? Is that for each individual organization? How uh, does the data lag? Uh, compared to what's actually happening on the ground. So there's just a lot of little uh, issues with a new system like that to work out. So uh, really ask everybody to be patient and uh, we're trying to sort through it and just make sure our, our goal is to vaccinate everybody in Snohomish County uh, as quickly as possible. And um, you know, some will not want the vaccine, but we want everybody that uh, will accept it uh, to have it as quickly as possible. So that's that's our goal and that's our focus here locally. So I think that wraps this up. This is Kristen in the Joint Information Center. Thank you again for joining us today and for your questions. We are going to wrap up for today. Please stay tuned for future media availabilities.